thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Our second reading is Proverbs 14, 15. The simple believe anything, but the prudent give thought to their steps. Our third reading is Matthew 11, 2 through 6. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. I have doubts. Do you? Do you have doubts? Do you tell others about them very often? I doubt it. <laughs> we fear that if we admit that we have doubts that people will say we've lost our faith but today I want to tell you that you can have a deep love for God a trust in Jesus even a faith that has grown in your life journey and that does not mean that you won't also struggle with issues like fear and doubt Jay Baker Jay Baker, who's pastor of Revolution Church, was in New York City. There's a branch there and now another one in Minneapolis. Released a book called Faith, Doubt, and Other Lines I've Crossed. <laughs> in which he encourages Christians to doubt. Encourages Christians to doubt. Question and to re-examine their belief. Which is what we've been doing in this series. Asking, what do I believe? Really looking at what we believe. But he encourages people to look at the Bible in pursuit of the unknown God of unlimited grace. Isn't that great? The unknown God of limit, limitless grace. And he's come to experience that in his own life. Now, if you don't know who uh, Jay Baker is, he's the son of televangelists. Uh-huh. Jim Baker and Tammy Faye Baker Mesner. So some of you remember them. 37-year-old, self-described evangelical punk preacher. That's what he calls himself. And he believes that the church has all too often misrepresented God and contributed to the sufferings of many. Have you seen that happen? I mean, this is what we've talked about a little bit in this series, is that the church often has presented this all too domesticated, civilized, cleaned up version of Christianity that confines God to our own understanding, yes? And confines then our experience of God. And it's this civilized, domesticated, refined, controlled, and controlling dogmatic Christianity that says, if you have any doubts, then you don't have faith. It's a judging and condemning kind of Christianity. True or true? There's an interview with Jay Baker that appeared in the Christian Post. And he says this in regards to that book. The idea is just that it's okay to question your faith. For some people, that's liberating enough, right? <laughs> you usually come out stronger for doing so. Growing up, I was always taught that doubt was something that was very forbidden. What I realized is that doubt is a part of faith. Hello. It's an element of it, not an opposite, as Paul Tillich said. That's a theologian. I thought that it was important to write about living in a mystery and realizing that if we want to serve a God that's actually God, we can't have God all figured out. <laughs> Belief is something known. Faith is about the unknown. Let me just repeat that. 
Belief is something known. Faith is about the unknown. So he says, I'm trying to get people to really grasp the idea of allowing themselves to doubt in faith. I'm trying to deconstruct faith and say that faith isn't about having it all figured out. Yay, isn't that liberating? Faith isn't belief. Doubt is built in with faith. Faith is not a fact. Faith has more in common with hope than it would with fact. There's always an unknowing when it comes to faith. So doesn't it seem reasonable then, church, that we would have doubts and questions? Yes? I often ask you, why do the Gospels say, do not fear, so often? (laughs) It's because that fully human and fully divine Jesus knows we experience fear and worry and doubt. And to that, God has to say, You don't have to live there. You don't have to live there. John the Baptist sent his disciples to ask Jesus a question. John the Baptist said, are you the one or should we be looking for another? Does that question surprise you? It's in the Bible, you've heard it before, but does it kind of surprise you? It's a fair question, don't you think? I mean, it's at the heart of Christianity. It's probably a question we should all ask. If Jesus is the one, then we ought to be following him. And if Jesus is not the one, then we ought not to be following him. Yeah? Now, I I just want to say as a little bit of an aside, this also raises that secondary question because we've too often misunderstood what it means to follow Jesus. Uh, Too often we have idolized him, judged and condemned others in his name, rather than actually follow in the way of Jesus. Isn't that the truth, church? Mm. But really, it begins, and what we're looking at today is that the questioning and John the Baptist asking, are you the one? I said earlier, perhaps you've been taught, like Jay Baker was, that it's a sign of a lack of faith to ask questions of God or to doubt, to explore the identity of Jesus rather than just follow and just accept whatever the church teaches. So if that's true, was John the Baptist showing a lack of faith when he asked, are you the one? Hmm. Check this out. I mean, we've got to understand who's asking this here. John, the cousin of Jesus, right? John, who leapt while still in his mother Elizabeth's womb when he met Jesus, the yet unborn. So John, yet unborn, recognized Jesus, yet unborn. Right? Huh. John, who would have heard about angel visitations to his own parents and to Jesus' parents. Their family, don't you think they told family stories? John, whose father tended in the temple, who would have been taught the messianic prophecies. John, who baptized Jesus. John, who said, there is one who comes after me whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. This is John, who said he saw the Holy Spirit come and descend upon Jesus. And who said, according to John 1, 34, I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. This is the same John who was preparing his disciples to watch for and ultimately follow the Messiah, right? In the Gospel of John 1, 35 to 37, we read, The next day John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. And when the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Do you get it? John even pointed and told his disciples, This is the one. And they left being his disciples and went and followed Jesus. This is John who was very, very clear. Right? He was certain. How is it that this John, who had this life experience, who knew all this, moved to a place of having doubts? 
Not only did he have this place of insecurity and questioning, he let his disciples know that he had doubts. Did you get that in the reading? He sent his disciples to Jesus with his question. Are you the one? So what prompted this crisis of faith for John the Baptist? Well, John was in prison. Some of you may not have realized that context for our passage. John was in prison. Herod had arrested John. You see, Herodias was the wife of Herod's brother, Philip. You gotta watch here. This is one of those relational models. So Herodias, similar name, is the wife of Herod's brother, Philip. However, Herod was having an affair with his brother's wife. Herod with Herodias. Hmm. Mm -mm -mm. And John the Baptist called him out on it. <laughs> yeah, he was not intimidated by Herod's earthly power. And Herod wanted to kill John, but he feared John's popularity. He feared the reaction of the people and what might happen if word got out that he had killed John because so many people consider John a prophet of God. So he arrested him. Now, it so happened while John was in prison that Herod had a birthday. And Herodias, his lover, right, brother's wife, sent her daughter to dance for Herod. And it was a wonderful dance and thoroughly pleased Herod. Not going there. <clears throat> he was so pleased that he pledged to give her whatever she asked for. Now, mother and daughter had worked out a little something. And so she asked for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. So in the context of John's doubt and his questions, we find John living between prison and a platter. No one's laughing. I thought that was, that was kind of clever. It wasn't originally mine, but I thought that was clever. Can you imagine that? Talk about living between your rock and your hard place. He's in prison and an impending death. John was in a crisis situation. Maybe you don't identify with that crisis, but have you been in crisis situations and found yourself doubting? Yeah. Let's be honest. Isn't that when we most often question and doubt is when things get hard and we wonder where God is or what's really what? What's really true? What can I count on? That's when we ask hard questions. You wonder if this is John's only question. Are you the one or, you know, is there a little implied something? You know, Canadians often ask these indirect questions. Canadians will ask something, but there's like a host of other questions that linger around it. Amen. It's very true. <laughs> it's very true. Some of them are leading questions. Don't you think that John might have been wondering if Jesus was coming for him or when Jesus might come to save him, to rescue him, or what might await him if Jesus didn't get there in time? Mm. When Jesus received the inquiry from John's disciples, he gave an impressive response. Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are, cur are cured, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the person who does not fall away on account of me. Now let me ask you, is this litany of good works and miracles meant to give John comfort? Go tell John, the dead are raised, the lame walk. Maybe the dead are raised might have given him comfort. I don't know. Scary, but comfort. Do you think it gives assurance regarding Jesus' identity? Is this good report of what Jesus is doing supposed to bring John back to his senses and go, oh, yeah, Jesus is the one. I know that. I know that. Is that what it's supposed to do? Here's what we miss. John already knew the miracles. In Matthew 11, verses 2 to 3, it tells us, when John heard in prison what Jesus was doing. Oh, wait a second, what? When John heard in prison what Jesus was doing, he sent his disciples to ask. 
and you know the question. It's precisely because he knew what Jesus was doing that he had the question. The miraculous work of Jesus did not eliminate his doubts. It brought them to the fore. But Jesus added that more challenging line. Blessed is the person who does not fall away on account of me. What's that about? We don't preach on this very often, right? It doesn't fit with a civilized, domesticated, safe, and secure version of the gospel. This is disturbing stuff. It's like Jesus was saying to him, John, I'm not coming through for you. I'm not getting you out of prison. I'm not sparing your life. Yes, I have done all this and more for others, but the path I choose for you is different from theirs. You'll be blessed, John, if this does not cause you to fall away. What exactly, one might ask, was the good news for John? Jesus knew all along that John had been imprisoned. He very well knew that the fate that John would face even then, Jesus understood his purpose was to save us, not from pain and suffering, but from meaninglessness. I would add also estrangement. For Jesus, John was exactly where he needed to be, fulfilling God's purposes for his life. And why would he save John from that? Let me just add, it's kind of like Jesus the world rejected the messenger. Right? Here was Herod doing the same thing with John. It's almost a precursor. John was doing what he was supposed to do, the world and the powers of the earth, like in Herod. Still thought they were powerful in the extreme. Jesus was doing what he needed to be doing doesn't seem to be very comforting. But in the midst of doubts and questions, Jesus calls on John and on us to have faith. Faith in the midst of the unknown. As Jay Baker said, there's always an unknowing when it comes to faith. We're going to ask our questions, we're going to have our doubts, and we can still trust. Don't you think Jesus himself knew this experience of having doubts and questions? I do. If Jesus was fully human and fully divine, don't you think he experienced faith and doubts? Don't you think Jesus himself had questions of God? Why does it have to be this way? Why do they have to suffer? Why do I have to suffer? So I take us to Jesus' own experience. Matthew 26. Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him and he get, began to be sorrowful and troubled, scripture says. Read deeper, church. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my God, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. And then in a few more verses after he'd come back and found the disciples. So he went away for a second time and prayed, My God, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. And he came back and found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Why, church, did Jesus need to pray three times? May this cup be taken from me. We're dealing with translations of languages. We're dealing with the oral tradition and writing it down much later. 
Can you imagine if Jesus had said, please take this away from me? Does it remove him saying, but not my will yours? No, I'm asking you to stay for a moment when Jesus didn't want it to happen. In that fully human moment, when we hear that he was so sorrowful and troubled, when he said he was sorrowful to the point of death, or as another gospel says, he sweat blood. The passion of his prayer was enough, as Michelle was saying this morning, for the capillaries on his face to start to burst. That's the sense of it. That kind of deep passion. We read a few short verses so quickly, we don't get that Jesus agonized in the garden. We call it the agony in the garden, but we don't even stay there. We are so troubled by the cross, we don't get this part. We don't get this place where Jesus is wrestling with what's going on and the why and the how. There's not a lot of scripture there for us. Yes, we know that he gets to not my will but yours, but I'm asking you to be in that place of why he asked in the first place. This fully human, this fully divine Jesus experienced and understood that doubts and questioning creep in in times of crisis. Does that not help you see that Jesus identifies with you fully? And that doesn't mean that you've lost your faith if you have a doubt or a question. But you might encounter God even more closely in facing that doubt. Maybe let that doubt drive you to prayer or drive you to ask the question again, are you the one? And listen for spirit to come back, speak to you. Sometimes spirit's going to say, yes, I'm the one, but I, I, you're, you're still going to go through this. And I'll be here with you. I'll be here through it with you. I could even say to you that on the cross, when Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I don't believe God forsook Jesus. That's me. But I believe he felt like that. You hear what I'm saying? There's lots of times you and I feel like God has forsaken us. And we agonize. I think that's a similar experience as in the garden. And it's hard for us to enter into that experience and really grasp it. The song Gethsemane from Jesus Christ Superstar captures that moment better than anything else that I know. Like I say, we jump over it so much, but in it, it's not just the biblical text, it's more, it's entering into what does it mean to have the agony in the garden, to be that kind of sorrowful. So in it, we hear Jesus wrestle with doubts and questions, and yes, he says, not my will but yours. But I believe that this song can help capture the depth of those simple words, take this cup from me. And I believe that this song may help you and I see doubt and faith coexisting and inviting us to an even closer relationship with the divine. Have a listen. Doesn't that introduce you to the human side, the struggle? Can you identify with the, I want to know, I want to know, my God? Have you felt yourself like that? Why, why? We ask those questions, why? And yet those of us who have suffered something difficult, and those of us who have suffered the loss of someone we love, even if we understood why, would it make the pain any less? Would we miss them any less? No. Has God promised we will live forever? Not on this earth. Has God promised everyone will see their 100th birthday? No. Or that we will all die peacefully in our sleep? No. And yet, we struggle. Why aren't you exempting me from this? Why aren't you rescuing me from this, saving me from this thing? Why, 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 why? And we don't know now. And most likely, the vast majority of us will not know now. So it seems like I don't have much hope for you. But I do, because I remind you of the evidence of John who did know. Who did see that Jesus was healing and giving sight and raising the dead. 
we don't see now, but our spiritual blindness too will be healed. Our inability to walk fully trusting (laughs) will also be healed. Faith does not exempt us from trials and temptations, sickness or death. Faith does not exempt us from doubts and questions. Faith does not stop us from asking why. So if you are experiencing that, do not fear that you have lost your faith. Simply let it draw you closer to the one who has the relationship with you to sustain you through those times. Because faith invites us to live. Live fully both in the known of belief and the unknown of the mystery to ask our questions of God. It is in seeking to understand, not just the demanding, but truly seeking to know the divine, to know the divine presence, to understand our own life, that we feel and find comfort in the midst of the struggle. I hope that the sermon series theme texts will also bring you hope and assurance that faith and doubt can coexist. In Proverbs, the simple believe anything, but the prudent give thought to their steps. And as you give that thought, it's going to cause you to ask questions and to know deeper and to lead you into even deeper mysteries that you yet don't even know how to ask the question about. And the text from 1 Corinthians When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put those childish ways behind me. For now we see as a reflection as in a mirror, and then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. May that give you comfort. I invite you to a time of silent reflection and confession.